encourage the members of the body to consider his life in its entirety and his contributions to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, notwithstanding the bad, Senator Harry F. Byrd um, had a life that left Virginia quite a legacy. And I would like to um, ask the members of this body to consider that that legacy is worthy of being recognized and perhaps being interpreted and allowing him to remain in Capitol Square and recognizing his role in history, um, the good and the bad. I want to take a minute and just tell you about Senator Byrd, who hails from my part of the Commonwealth of Virginia um, and is very, very well known um, to many of you in this body for the legacy he left on how the Commonwealth of Virginia operates. Um, he was not a man who was born into wealth. He made his money through very careful investments um, and in the apple business. And it's told that he, in order to transport his apples, he bought a horse and a modified buggy and very quickly learned the economic advantages of having uh, a better transportation and road system around our region. Um, he also was well known for uh, taking the Winchester Evening Star, which he um, took over from his father, and it was in uh, great debt at the time, and he decided that he was going to try to keep it alive, and he needed to borrow money in order to get the paper from the paper company, and they would not give him any credit. So, being thrifty as he was, he decided that he would ask for the credit on a day-to-day -day basis and pay for the paper every day. And ironically, that was his first foray into the pay-as-you-go system that we, that we now know about, it became so famous, and he literally paid for the paper every day in order to publish a paper every day. Um, he was president, not too long after that, of the Shenandoah Valley Turnpike Company, again, recognizing the importance of roads. Um, and in that time, he was paid $33 a month for that job, and they built the road between Winchester and Stanton for $460,000. You know the rest of the history of Harry F. Byrd Sr. He went on to become a state senator, a governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, a United States senator. He was selected by the Democratic Convention in Virginia uh, in 1928 as a favorite for the United States presidency. And in fact, was offered the vice presidency um, at the convention if he would release his delegates to Roosevelt. And he declined, hoping that he might actually win. He went on to the United States Senate to talk about his accomplishments in Virginia, um, working to a balanced budget, pushing through constitutional amendments that revolutionized how we work in Virginia, how we manage our budget, how we work through a pay-as-you-go. And one of the comments he made, this is a quote from Senator Byrd, permit me to say at the opening of my remarks that I had spent a good portion of my life working for sound expansion of highways. In 1915, I went to the State Senate of Virginia, where I served for 10 years. I became chairman of the Virginia Senate Roads Committee. I was patron of the bill in 1923, providing for the establishment of the first state highway system in Virginia. As governor of Virginia, one of my major efforts was to improve our road system. Virginia is a pay-as-you-go state. Not a single bond has been issued by the state since 1835. He was proud of the highway system that he created. He was proud of our pay-as-you-go system. And certainly the great stain on Senator Harry F. Byrd Jr.'s career was when this country was being ripped apart by segregation. He was an advocate of massive resistance. And that is a great stain on his career and a great embarrassment. And I acknowledge that 
And I think we all in Virginia acknowledge that. But he was a man of a certain time and a certain era. And he can be distinguished from others in Virginia whose stories were different and whose histories we view differently. And so I would just ask the members of this body to look at the whole man and consider that we are each a sum of all of our parts, the good and the bad, and that Virginia has a history of good and bad. And this is a son of my part of Virginia whose contributions to the Commonwealth of Virginia um, will linger forever in this state through our Constitution, through how we manage the Commonwealth of Virginia, through his legacy. And his legacy goes beyond most of what I've mentioned. It includes Shenandoah National Park, Skyline Drive, the Blue Ridge Parkway, our entire park system. And I could go on for a very long time. But with that, I would just like to offer um, those words about Senator Byrd, certainly conceding the good and the bad, but ask you to please consider allowing some part of his history to remain in Capitol Square. Thank you, Mr. President. What purpose does the senior senator from Fairfax, Senator Saslaw, rise? Mr. President, this is to speak for the passage of the resolution. Senator, the floor. Um, you know, we've been asked to, you know, overlook you know, uh, what a major part, certainly a major part of his life and remembrance was, but uh, I would say to uh, the senator from Fauquier County that uh, it's almost like saying, other than that, Ms. Lincoln, how'd you enjoy the play? And um, the, um, uh, during the, uh, when the bill was before rules, the, um, one of the members said, you know, well, what about, uh, Jefferson, what about Washington? They had slaves. Um, first off, let's look at the time frame. George Washington was born approximately 113 years, 114 years after the uh, first slaves arrived around 1619 in Jamestown. Jefferson was born about 123 years after that. Harry Byrd, Senator Byrd, on the other hand, was born 268 years after that arrival in 1887. Not only that, it was uh, uh, 22 years after the abolition of slavery at the end of the Civil War. Um, yes, uh, uh, Jefferson and Washington did have slaves, but that's not what they're known for. One led us to victory over the British, and the other was instrumental in organizing this country. And while certainly there's no excuse for you know owning slaves, as I said, that's not what they were known for. And in addition to that, in that time frame, uh, a large part of America did. Remember, there was no Midwest, there was no West Coast, uh, there wasn't much as far southwest. Essentially, it was basically the 13 colonies, so you had almost half of the, the country uh, in that position. But as I said, that's not what they were known for. Uh, and um, Probably 100,000 students, if not more, in this state were kept out of school for four years simply because the United States Supreme Court ruled that under Brown versus the Board of Education that you couldn't have separate but equal. It simply didn't exist. And it was a 9-0 decision, which upset Senator Byrd. As a result, like I said, over 100,000 students in Virginia were kept out of school for four years. Now, we talked about over the last year the damage being done to young people just because they couldn't attend school on a regular basis and uh, had to do virtual learning. I would remind you all that these 100,000 kids had no ex access to virtual learning and they were out of school for four years. And some of them, years later, are still living with the psychological damage done by that. 
So, including uh, at least one of the members of this body, and if there's others, I'm not aware of it, but at least one of the members. And um, it's not something that we can simply overlook. I'm sure, like most people, he, he probably had some good traits, but this was a major, major problem. And um, I just don't see how we can overlook uh, the fact that all of these children, for no other reason than their race, for no other reason than their race, were kept out of school for four years. Um, I think that we, we need to relocate that statute and should not be uh, honoring you know, people who, you know, at least to that degree in Capitol Square, um, somebody who would have uh, forced a policy on this state. Keep in mind, he was in the U.S. Senate. He wasn't even in the state legislature. And he exercised the power that he had uh, over a governor and a general assembly. So I would ask, you know, that you take all this into consideration when you cast your vote, I think there's a perfectly valid good reason for having this resolution here today and would ask its passage. What purpose is the senior senator from Richmond City, Senator McClellan, rise? Speaking to the resolution. Senator, is the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that we pass this uh, bill. Capitol Square is the ultimate public park in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Capitol Square and everything on it and in it should reflect the values of our Commonwealth. In addition to leading massive resistance, there's a lot more complicated to Harry Byrd's legacy. Michael Paul Williams wrote a column questioning whether we should put the Byrd statute in context. And after receiving a phone call from Fergie Reed, the first African-American elected to this body since Reconstruction, came to the conclusion there was no context that could be placed on a statue on Capitol Square, the ultimate public park, with public art that could erase the pain that Harry Byrd and his legacy invokes for African American Virginians. Michael Paul Williams summed it up when he said, the legacy of our ancestors' enslavement still resides in our DNA, sapping our mental and physical well-being. But none of us experienced that firsthand. Reed's generation and others born after him lived through the dehumanization that Byrd perpetuated and fought it. In addition to mass resistance, he was the architect of helping disenfranchise African-American voters in Virginia. He called integration the gravest crisis since the war between the states. He vocalized the sex-based panic behind school segregation by saying, what our people fear most is that by this close, intimate social contact, future generations will intermarry. He pronounced that law enforcement should be by the white people of this country. These are just a few of the things he believed. He was the architect and the face of massive resistance, not just in Virginia, but across this country. And as the senior senator from Fairfax said, we are still, still dealing with the aftermath of that, with unequal schools, 
inequity in our schools, inequity in our neighborhoods, inequity in every system we have in Virginia. And because we don't talk about it, and we, because we don't talk about the ugly parts of it, we didn't talk about it for so long. We glossed over it. We're still trying to figure out how to grapple with it. There are other places this statue can go and be put into context. But let me tell you, when I was an intern in this body in, high school, in, in college, when I was an intern working for the first African-American governor and walked past that statue every day, I knew I was his worst nightmare. I knew it. I know it now. I feel it every time I walk past it. I think about the damage he inflicted on this commonwealth and on the African-American community we are still trying to eradicate. He does not belong on the grounds of the ultimate public park in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Let's find somewhere else to put him and put the context there. Thank you, Mr. President. For what purpose is Senator from Roanoke County, Senator Suterline rise? Speaking briefly to the measure. Senator, the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think the senior senator from Fairfax and the senior senator from Richmond City have both had some very insightful points about the situation. Um, but I think it's important that uh, someone else speak to it as well. The senator from Richmond spoke about when she was um, her early time in Capitol Square. And, and it reminds me of one of my very early times in Capitol Square. There was a speech being given by uh, the late Senator Yvonne Miller. And she was speaking against a education reform bill that I think offered great promise and I wish that we had passed it and I think Virginia would be better off. And as she spoke about it though, she talked about where she feared it would take us. And I had some other young aides come in my office and say, are you hearing what we usually called her YB? Because in short, there were m multiple Senator Millers. Are you hearing what YB is saying? She's talking about that there might not be a, a public school for black kids to go to. That's crazy. And it was, it was a pretty, pretty intense experience because I think she was wrong about what was happening, but they had no idea about massive resistance. These were folks that worked here in Capitol Square, worked on legislation, walked by that statue every day because we used to actually have to bring the bills to the Capitol to introduce them uh, for the legislators so they could be formally introduced later. Walked by that dozens of times, no idea about massive resistance. And I don't think that there's a way to contextualize the statue there something I've thought about a lot. Uh, I'll probably shock you all how much I've spent thinking about this bill this session. But I don't think there's a way to contextualize it. I don't think that there's any reason, uh, any benefit to it continuing there. And tomorrow's the 65th anniversary of him calling for massive resistance. And if you think about the quick math in your head, you'll realize it wasn't just a quick reaction to the Brown decision. He calculated, waited, 
and then called for this aggressive posture and then assembled thousands of people at Capitol Square to try to hit Governor Amon, who I have no interest in ever defending despite his, his ties to the Roanoke Valley, to try to force the General Assembly and the governor down this path. And I come from a district that um, is very interesting. There's, there was times when Virginia only sent two Republicans to this body. And they were usually from where Senator Obenshane, Senator from Rockingham, and, and where I'm from, Floyd and Carroll. And the reason that they sent, they knew that they were sending Republicans who would not get assigned to committees that met. They knew that they were sending Republicans who would not get assigned to conference committees because they weren't on the committees to begin with. And it was a point of defiance against the Byrd organization. Even though they recognized it was not great for, for them, it was that important. He was not simply a man of his time. There were folks openly defying him in the New River Valley, the Roanoke Valley, and the Shenandoah Valley, and in several cities across the Commonwealth. But it was very hard for anyone to effectively politically oppose him because they passed a series of laws at his direction to make it virtually impossible. It's no coincidence that the Byrd organization collapses after the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the striking down of the poll tax. It all happens right there at the same time. And so I appreciate the remarks. I think I, I have no interest in, in going through a series of things. I don't want to injure um, folks from, from his area. But it was not simply a creature of his time. There were folks actively fighting him. And it, it took outside intervention to allow it to happen. And then Virginia chose to go very different directions on several of the things that I think they would have chosen earlier. So it, it's with that, I think that tomorrow being the 65th anniversary, it's fitting that we take this action before then and we don't continue to honor something that should not be honored. For what purpose is Senator from Hampton, Senator Locke, rise? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, there are a few of us here in the General Assembly who call ourselves the Brown Babies. And um, we call ourselves that, that's Delegate McQuinn, Delegate Ward, um, myself, because we were born in a year that of Brown versus the Board of Education. And um, the year that the Supreme Court decided that schools should be uh, desegregated. And on May 17th, 1954, uh, that day in states like Virginia um, and other Southern states was actually called Black Monday, the day that the Supreme Court handed down that decision. Um, and it is unfortunate that here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, an individual like Harry F. Byrd Sr. became the architect, the architect of a plan that he would coin a phrase called massive resistance. That is anything that would thwart that decision that schools would be integrated to the point the schools would close down and not allow an individual who sits here on the floor of this Senate to go to school. Where that person still deals with the vestiges of having to have dealt with not being able to be educated because of what Harry F. Byrd Sr. decided to do 
as a United States senator because he decided that black folks should not go to school, should not be educated, should not have the benefit of an education. This was not in the late 1700s of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. This was not in the 1800s. This was in, 19, in the 1950s that he made this decision. All other things aside for what he did, he orchestrated massive resistance. And he does not deserve a place on Capitol Square. And with that, Mr. President, I again move passage of HB 22808. Question is, shall House Bill 2208 pass? All in favor of the motion will record their vote aye. Those opposed, no. Are the senators ready to vote? Have all the senators voted? Do any senators desire to change their vote? The clerk will close the roll. Ayes 36, no's 3. Ayes 36, no's 3, House Bill 2208 passes.